Hello and welcome to Your Brain Explained, the show which gives you a sneak peek inside your head. I am Julia Ravy and today I'm going to be giving you a little bit of a guided tour of your brain. Now a brain is something we all have. It's an organ just like your heart or your liver. But there's always been a sort of essence of mystery surrounding the brain because it makes us who we are. Over 2000 years ago, the idea of what the brain did was really up for debate. You have Plato who described the brain as being the seat of consciousness, whereas Aristotle said the brain was simply a radiator for cooling the passions of the heart. Moving forward to the end of the 19th century, we were able to finally zoom in on the brain and see that it is made up of cells. So the exact way our brain functions has only really come to light over the past century. Now we have technology which is almost superior to our own brains, which means we can really delve deep into the mind and uncover some of those mysteries. I am a neuroscientist and I thought it would be really great for me to acquaint you with your head. So let me take you on a guided tour of your brain. Now before I begin the official tour, I would just like to say there are two sides to every story and your brain is no different. Your brain is made up of two hemispheres, one on the right hand side of your body and one on the left hand side. So when I'm talking about these different regions like the lobes of your brain, you have one of these lobes on the right and one on the left. The hemispheres of your brain actually control the opposite side of the body because you know, the brain just likes to be confusing like that. This is because the nerves which exit your brain through the spinal cord actually cross over. So the right hand side of your brain controls the left side of your body and the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. Just to make it really, really simple. Now that's settled, let's start the tour. If you look at your brain, you may notice three distinct regions. These are the brainstem, the cerebellum and the cerebrum. So let's start our tour on the ground level, the base level of the brain, and that is the brainstem. The brainstem for your brain is like the foundations of a house. Without this, we would not be alive, we would not be standing. The brainstem is the most ancient part of the brain and is often referred to as the reptilian brain. And this is because we share this part of our brain with our scaly ancestors dating back millions and millions of years. Your brainstem controls the functions you don't even have to think about. This includes your breathing, your heart rate and your blood pressure. So you can definitely call the brainstem basic. Now, if we travel up the brainstem, we meet another region of the brain. This region is described as looking a bit like a walnut. It's very wrinkly and it sort of sits at the back of the brain. And this is our cerebellum. The reason the cerebellum is so wrinkly is because it is packed with brain cells. It's actually one of the densest regions of the brain in terms of cell number. And although this brain region looks small, its function is mighty. The cerebellum is responsible for coordinating muscle movements to produce a specific action. This could be something like hitting a tennis ball or playing the piano. So if you are one of those people who are constantly dropping their phone on their face or falling over their own feet, you can partially blame your cerebellum. Your brain and muscles are in constant communication to update each other about where the body is and what it needs to do next. And this is even the case when you're just chilling on the couch watching Netflix. The cerebellum grants this direct line so you can watch your new series in peace without unwanted body movements. The cerebellum is also the king of practice makes perfect because when you practice a skill, this is training the signaling from your brain to the muscle groups that are used in that skill. And this happens through the cerebellum. So even if you haven't ridden a bike in years, you could jump on one now and ride off without falling off thanks to your cerebellum. More recent research indicates the function of the cerebellum strays from just movement. And actually it could be really important in other cognitive events like emotional regulation. But more on that in another video. Now, as we exit the cerebellum, you will see in front of you the largest region of the brain. This is your cerebrum or cerebral cortex, and it is the part of the brain which makes us most human. This part of the brain is covered in folds, and that is so we can pack in a lot of brain cells. So say you take a towel and fold it up, you can get it to be really, really small. But you know when you unfold it, it's really big. And that's what these folds are for in your brain. They basically mean we can fit in a lot more cells, and that means we can perform a lot more functions. 
The grooves you see in the cerebrum are called sulci, and that originates from a word meaning wrinkles. And the bumps are called gyri, and this stems from a word in Latin which means ring. Brains without folds do exist, and this is a condition called lysencephaly. This is a rare set of brain disorders which causes developmental delays and sometimes cognitive impairments as well as seizures. This is all due to reduced surface area in the brain. Our cerebrums are a lot more developed than many other animals and has given us our evolutionary advantage to climb to the top of the food chain. So what is it inside these folds that makes us so human? If you follow me, we will find out. Due to the complexity and size of the cerebrum, we can split it up into lobes. Now these lobes are interconnected, meaning they can talk to each other, but they all hold specific functions in making you, you. So if we are continuing our walking tour, we are going to enter the cerebrum at the back of the brain, and this will land us straight in to the occipital lobe. This is the smallest of the cerebral lobes, but with a major function processing what you see. Yes, that's right, the region of the brain connected to the eyes is at the furthest point from the eyes. Makes sense. We can make a guess that potentially this area developed before the other higher human functions, processing what you see is still quite basic. So it's at the back there with the cerebellum and the brainstem. Also, as signals travel from the eye, they don't just go straight to the back, but they also signal to other brain regions as well. And this wouldn't be able to happen if the eye region was connected straight on the back of the eyes. And just to confuse things more, some of the nerves from your right eye project into the left occipital lobe, and some from your left eye into the right occipital lobe. This is weird, I know, but most likely this crossing over of the nerves is so both occipital lobes get an idea of what's going on in the whole visual space. And this then gives you a whole picture of where you are. The occipital lobe is where signals from the eye are processed into visual information. And this is features like color, depth, and shape much like a program which can convert computer code. These process signals are then sent off to other brain regions. Moving out of the occipital lobe and along behind your ears, you will find the temporal lobe. Being behind the ears, this lobe is important in processing incoming sounds and also in interpreting language. When you play your favorite song, the sound waves enter your ears. The ears then convert these sound waves into signals which enter the brain and in the temporal lobe these are processed and sent to the rest of the brain which could put you in a really good mood when it's your favourite song. If we go deeper into the temporal lobe, so away from the ears and in towards the middle of the brain, you will find your emotional brain or your limbic system and this includes regions which are important in fear processing and also in your fight or flight response. Also, the temporal lobe contains areas which are important for making memories, and especially the converting of new experiences into long-term storage. Now we are going to climb up the bumps and grooves of the brain to the lobe which is at the top of your head, and this is your parietal lobe. The major role of this lobe is to process sensory information. The parietal lobe is where the sensory nerves from within your body signal to to tell the brain what's going on down there. For example, if a spider lands on your arm, the arm nerves will signal up to your parietal lobe, which can then pass this information on to the rest of the brain. And I'm sure that is the fear region for a lot of you. The parietal lobe processes both benign and painful sensations. And it also contains a map of your body from these sensory projections. There are regions for every body part, and the size of these regions depends on the sensitivity of that particular body part. So for example, your thumb has a really large area in the parietal lobe, whereas your thigh has a much smaller region. And that explains why it hurts so much when you get a paper cut on your thumb. The parietal lobe also allows you to identify objects by touch by combining sensory information with visual information. And the final stop of our tour today is the most complex and the most human. It is the frontal cortex. As the name suggests, the frontal cortex is at the front of your brain and it is the largest lobe. This is the region responsible for abstract thinking, your personality, emotional expression, and problem solving. The frontal lobe has allowed us as humans to be expressive, to create art, to solve some of the hardest problems, and to make memes. 
like the parietal lobe, this brain region also contains a map of the body, but this time the map is for our motor actions. The size of each muscle region is proportional to the complexity of the target muscle. Meaning once again, your thigh region, which although it is a big muscle, is much smaller than your hand region. Because your hand can do things like write and paint, whereas your thigh can move up and down, back and forwards. The frontal cortex is still a real mystery because it is responsible for so many of our behaviours. But we know that we can live without it. And this is from a case of a man called Phineas Gage who actually had his frontal cortex impaled. Phineas was at work one day and an unplanned explosion led an iron bar to go through his eye socket and come out through the top of his head. And this passed straight through his frontal cortex. Now Phineas came out of this accident relatively okay. I mean, he had a physical injury, but in terms of its mental impact on him, there didn't seem to be much wrong at first. But over time, his friends and family reported that he'd basically become a completely different person. He'd lost all of his inhibitions, he'd become really aggressive, he couldn't plan things very well. And these are all functions we now know to be associated with that frontal cortex. Phineas's story shows us that the frontal cortex is really important for our personal interactions, but not necessarily important for our physical survival. So that concludes our brain tour. You can exit via the spinal cord and feel free to browse our cerebral gift shop. Now we know where everything is and we've been acquainted with the different brain regions, in my future videos, I will really delve into the science behind the human mind. Oh, that rhymes, that rhymes. Thank you for taking time to watch today. I hope you enjoyed um, and I hope you enjoyed the animations too. That is something that I am working on getting into the videos because I think with science you really need to be able to visualize what I'm talking about if I just say loads of words it's a bit harder to get your head around so I hope you like them as well if you're enjoying the content please subscribe and if you have any questions for me anything brainy anything PhD -y, anything women in STEM -y, then hit me up on my social media platforms or in the comments of this video I hope you have an amazing week and now that you know a bit more about your brain, it's extra productive.